Hi everybody, welcome back to my YouTube channel. Welcome or welcome back if by any chance you are just stumbling upon a random video and you like the topic of AI trends and especially the trends in the NLP, make sure to hit the subscribe button and stick around. In this video, I want to give you sort of a gist of what I have learned so far while doing a research and writing a book about it and having this channel for almost two years now and interacting with the amazing GPT-3 ecosystem. So if you are somebody that is considering trying out GPT-3 or you are already using it and want to learn a little bit more about it or you're just simply curious, just in theory, not even trying to use it, what the technology is. Here I want to give you my five key takeaways from the research so far. So let's get going. Takeaway number one. GPT-3 is a language model, an algorithm that uses language as its primary data. It was built using a large data set consisting of many books, lots of internet pages, lots of Wikipedia articles, publicly available code, what have you. Long story short, in machine learning, when you want to build a model, you need to train it on a data set. And the type and size of data depends on what type of tasks you want to solve with the model. GPT-3 in specific was built using five datasets. Common Crawl, Web Text 2, Book 1 and Book 2, and Wikipedia. Common Crawl includes text data collected over eight years of web crawling. Web Text 2 is an internal OpenAI dataset that was built by scrapping various web pages of particularly high content quality. An interesting fact is that it includes Reddit and Reddit interactions in different subreddits as part of its dataset. Books 1 and Books 2 is basically a dataset that OpenAI created by combining collectively thousands of books on various subjects. And finally, Wikipedia is a dataset that includes all the existing English language articles of Wikipedia. In 2019, which is when it was created, it was roughly 2.8 million articles. A lot. So these datasets altogether include nearly 1 trillion words, which is a massive, massive dataset. Thanks to that, GPT-3 is super skilled at interacting with language, particularly English language, but also other languages as well. If you're curious what other languages it excels at, I will leave a link to a cool resource on that below. Takeaway number two. Having been trained on this enormous amount of data, GPT-3 turned out to be really skilled at many language-related tasks. And in particular, I saw it being really skilled at text generation. This is actually the task that GPT-3 excels at. This is its favorite task and this is something where it shines. GPT-3 is basically capable of generating textual content that is indistinguishable from something that a human could write. So think of all the possible applications of that. You can generate text for blog articles that look exactly like the ones that are written by humans, different type of social media content, storytelling. There are books being written with the help of GPT-3, for example, which is astonishing and many, many more. Another task that I saw GPT-3 is really good at is text summarization. So this is basically taking a lengthy text. Think of a passage from the book or research paper or a really long email and then creating a really concise and exact summary of this text while focusing on the most important information and while making sure that the meaning remains. GPT-3 is really good at this task as well. Classification is another example of language-related task that GPT-3 is really good at. Text classification is basically about categorizing text into organized groups. GPT-3 can analyze text and then assign a set of tags or categories to it. One common example of classification is sentiment analysis. And my favorite example with GPT-3 I experimented with is Twitter sentiment analysis, where you get a bunch of tweets and you ask GPT-3 to assign categories such as negative, positive, neutral to understand what's the 
emotion, what's the sentiment behind this tweet. And then GPT-3 is able to really nicely categorize the tweets based on the actual sentiment behind it. Another interesting task that I found GPT-3 being good at is search. GPT-3 and similar language models are a really powerful alternative and improvement to the existing search engine algorithms. Currently, companies like Algolia or Google are experimenting with these big language models, called large language models in the literature, and are finding really interesting results when it comes to the search capabilities. This is by no means an exhaustive list of tasks that GPT-3 can do, but these are the tasks that I found the most interesting and at the same time bringing a big potential when it comes to different use cases, which I will go into right now. Number three. It turns out that GPT-3 is really useful <laughs> in the sense that you can actually use it in different contexts and achieve really interesting results. The existing use cases of GPT-3 are, in my opinion, just scratching the surface of what is possible with this model and with the similar models. So if you're just joining the GPT-3 subject and you're worried that you are falling behind and so much has happened and so many use cases have been explored, fear not, there is still plenty of business opportunities. There's enormous room for artistic exploration of this tool and I encourage you to check it out and think of creative ways of using it. The most impressive use cases I have found so far were applications built to solve everyday problems or basically built to make things that we normally do that are cumbersome easier or using GPT-3 as a medium of art. Some of my favorite companies using GPT-3 are Copy AI, Fable Studio, Other Side AI, and there are many, many more. I have explored some of these on my channel so far. If you are interested in diving deeper into different types of businesses using GPT-3, let me know in the comment section. Number four, and bear with me, even though it might get a little bit nerdy here. <laughs> GPT-3 is part of a bigger AI trend happening right now that is really good to understand in like a little bit wider context. When we first started to hear about startup revolution, we heard the catchy phrase, software is eating the world. I believe this is the phrase coming from Andresen Horowitz. Machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence field, is now using the phrase to say that machine learning is eating software, and actually even more recently that NLP is eating machine learning. <laughs> what does that mean? So NLP stands for natural language processing. Natural language processing is a mix of disciplines that include computer science, linguistics, artificial intelligence, and that focuses on creating a successful interaction between computers and humans. NLP uses machine learning to create intelligent machines that are able to understand natural language. And natural language is as simple as human language, the language that humans use to communicate. Now, within NLP, in 2017, there was a big breakthrough. The architecture called Transformer was invented and started powering very powerful models that were initially language models but that are now exploring different use cases in computer vision for example. GPT-3 is a fruit of a young research, a research that has already brought to life many just as interesting models as GPT-3. So this is just the beginning. GPT-3 was a massive breakthrough because up until the point that this model was created, there wasn't really a general language model that could perform an array of language-related tasks. Typically, we were really successful at designing models that were really good at solving only one specific tasks. For example, summarization or classification or other tasks that I have mentioned before. So being more and more general at solving language-related tasks is really what GPT-3 revolutionized. And that's why it's so interesting, powerful and useful. Some people in the industry also claim that GPT-3 is a, an important step towards artificial general intelligence. So creating systems that are capable of just handling more and more tasks the way humans do. Number five. 
finally, with big power comes big responsibility. And what I mean by that is that this big shift that was created with the development of transformers and large language models created a massive opportunity for variety of applications, for different types of models that have more and more powerful abilities and more and more power to tackle all the possible tasks that you can think of. But we also need to understand how to optimally design them. We are still trying to understand how they work, how to make them non-toxic and non-harmful. And there is still an amazing research being done in the area of how to make sure that the models are safe to use and that the applications that are being powered by these models are safe and non-harmful for the end users. And I am really hopeful because I can see that the companies developing these models are really stressing on their responsibility and the ethical aspect of it and are doing really good progress in terms of the research of how to tackle the potential challenges. That's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know if you have any questions or comments below and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.